สวัสดีค่ะ Good morning and welcome to our real-time live streaming interview sessions here as part of the 19th Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. I'm with you once again. I'm Pachuri Raksa Wong. Today is the third and final day. A lot happening. Wrapping up just now was a session on translating research into practice and policy. The moderator of that session is sitting right next to me here, welcoming once again Professor Prapan Panu Park, director of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. So what do you think? Good morning, everyone. This is the second time that I have seen all of you here on 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 television. Uh -huh. uh, so we just finished our. Uh, uh, Symposium. We would like to ask our first speaker, Professor Anthony Kelleher from Kirby Institute in Sydney, to join us uh, at this uh, expert interview here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, yeah. uh, Good morning. You mentioned about the discovery and being used in either laboratories and the clinics here. Usually, this kind of, 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 of in, uh, invention costs a lot. Yes. And the products that come out, you know, either the diagnostic test or, or medications, are very expensive. How can we minimize this problem so that you know can you, you, you still can allow the research, innovation, and at the same time the products can be can reach the end users faster and more effectively. So I, I, that's a that's a very difficult question, yes, Raman, and I'm it not is. surprised you ask me difficult <laughs> questions, uh, but. Uh, you know, I think uh, there, there are two ways to approach that. I think one, uh, that when these things are being developed, uh, certainly, you know, in terms of, particularly in terms of diagnostic tests, then, you know, ways of simplifying the test and making it easily accessible during the developmental process, you can, you can incorporate those things. As I was saying in my talk, the, the, the simpler, the answer, the more likely it is to translate. And if you can make your tests simpler and simpler, and then, then you're more likely to make them cheaper as well. And so one way is to think about that during the developmental process and have that as one of your aims. Uh, and I guess that's probably easier for academic research than for, for uh, commercial research. The, the other way is, is, is to have differential pricing, I guess, where you get the, the people that can pay to pay a, a higher cost for the, for the test, and that subsidizes the, the cost of the test or the drug in, uh, in, in uh, less resourced countries and environments. Yeah, usually the new products, you know, yeah. it's a, mostly it will be better than the old, the, the, the older products, right? Usually. Usually, Usually, but I mean, yeah. again, things can be repurposed uh -huh. as well. And, and, you know, I mean, I think David Cooper talked very much about, you know, the stra strategic research and, you mm -hmm. know, the, the demonstration of those yeah. trials was that that wasn't dependent on a particular drug, but a particular mm -hmm. strategy of using yeah. those drugs. So my question is when the new discovery, new product is usually better than, than the older ones, can, for example, the, the new product, which is better, they will reduce their own price so that all the other older products will then be killed, K I L L E D. Well, so that yes. you know everyone will enjoy the newer so, products so because you that in, that in larger that's, sale. That's another strategy, I guess, that you, you undermine the market of the, of the of the competitors by uh, by competitive pricing. But I guess then you need to be sure that your market is going to be large enough to that, so that your marginal cost is makes your expenses recoverable. Tony, the last, my last question is, what would you tell us in terms of the, the you know, the, uh, uh, classical academic researchers, not, mm. not working for the companies or whatever, how they should, how should they frame their research in order to fulfill the, the, the future use, the, the application of, the, of their own research in the university and how can they do it? Well, so I, I, think, I think there's two parts of that. One, one, there is discovery for discovery's sake, and that's very important because you're never sure how those discoveries might be right, used. Yeah. Uh, you know, the discovery of retroviruses in animals clearly uh, advanced our understanding of HIV rapidly. So, so th that sort of research is very important, but when you think that you have something that uh, actually has a diagnostic or therapeutic uh, uh, outcome, then I think, you know, you need to think about where the market for that is and then 
you know, really from very early on in the development, make sure that you're developing the assay or the drug so that it will be accessible to that market. Right, now research is extremely important because hopefully with research we get more successful, successful and we're taking a step forward each time to finally um, coming up with a cure. What are some challenges um, that, or some obstacles that we have to overcome to quicken things? Well, so I think cure is, 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 uh, is an aspirational goal, I think. And, you know, the, the biology of, of HIV is such that it's integrated into our genome. We have to find ways of basically getting a piece of genetic material out of that genome in every cell that, mm -hmm. that contains that virus. And so that's, that's, that's a huge challenge. And so a, a, a very detailed understanding of, we're either going to need a very detailed understanding of that biology with a lot more basic research, or we're going to have to strike it lucky and have a serendipitous discovery where something works mm -hmm. when we didn't necessarily expect that it would. Mm. So, you know, the challenges are profound for Cure. Okay. Thank you very much, Tony. Okay. Thank okay. you very Thank much. You. Thank you for joining us. Professor Pleasure. Anthony you Kelleher. Much. And um, we are still going to continue with this topic, translating research into practice and policy. We are now going to bring on our next guest. Now, he is um, Professor Frank Hobbelens, the Academic Medical Center and Amsterdam Institute of Representative from there, the Global Hello. Health and Professor Development. Welcome. Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Good morning to you, Professor Frank. Thank you. Welcome to our interview session here. Now, you just uh, came uh, from the conference room and you were sharing your presentations with the audience. Can you give us an overview here on what was delivered by you inside the conference room? Well, this would, so my background is in tuberculosis and I used the, the basically examples from uh, from the tuberculosis field with regard to how research is being translated into policy and I distinguished two sort of major areas. One is more on operations research linked to implementation of, of, of disease control activities um, at, at the sort of grassroots level mm -hmm. and the other one was more about global policy and how does that translate into, uh, into new interventions being implemented and picked up. And the main message for the first part was that it is, in, for that setting, very important to uh, engage from the very beginning policymakers in the process, make sure that there is a research agenda at national, sometimes even local level, that speaks to the needs with regard to, uh, to, uh, to tuberculosis control, and to make sure that the, there is direct dissemination to policymakers. Policymakers are basically involved in each and every step of mm -hmm. the research process. With regard to global level or global recommendations, it was much more about how can we come from guidelines, global recommendations that are based on clinical trials, for example, how can we go to implementation in countries, which requires much more evidence and a much broader set of evidence than just evidence about efficacy of a drug or accuracy of a new diagnostic. And so you need much to know much more about applicability, feasibility, acceptability, whether it actually meets the needs of patients and, and clinicians uh, in those settings. And, and that's always an issue in tuberculosis, whether it is cost effective and affordable. Mm -hmm. During your talk, you mentioned about you know, a very good, effective instrument, okay, the gene expert that can diagnose uh, the TB bugs and also the resistance of that drug, uh, uh, to uh, do, uh, resistance to the drugs. But it has, you know, it has not been well used to the to the full capacity. You know, uh, how can we uh, suggest to the, uh, the country or the uh, uh, public health officer how to use that more effectively? Well I, well, I think indeed that, that gene expert is not, at least not yet, living up to its promise and because of the much higher sensitivity. And we, I haven't even discussed the, the issues around drug resistance, but just looking at, at uh, its, its ability to, di to diagnose 
uh, TB patients with a much higher sensitivity and much quicker than what we, that, that what we had until now. And, and I think it doesn't live up to its promise because it actually, if you want to use such a technology to its full promise, you have to use it at the level where patients are, which is often in community clinics. If you wait until they've been referred and referred um, where usually the machine is sitting, then there is hardly any benefit in that respect. And I think that is what we're seeing. And I think also we need more research and probably also more discovery to, to use these kind of technologies in, a, in that sense in a more e effective way. At the same time, the test is also expensive. And then you said if we put that at the, in the community level, which, you, which is closer to the, to the, to the patient that, you know, to, to be used, that's, yeah. that's true. Then you must need many, many more, a lot of yeah. machines uh, yeah. throughout the country, for example. Yeah. So, well, well, I think, and that's, that's, that's more, I think, also a question of research and development. I think well, there, there are two sort of possible solutions. One is to come up with a, 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 re, a true point of care test, which I think is a long shot in tuberculosis. And I think man, many uh, test developers are working on it, but it seems not to be very easy. So in the end, you want the sort of one dollar test that can be, can be used uh, uh, at the bedside. But I think as long as we don't have that, what will probably help is a, what I call a triage test. I'll be talking about that tomorrow in the afternoon also a little bit, which would, which would give you at least a sort of stratification of, of, for, the, for the patient. So whether the patient has a high probability that he or she actually has tuberculosis. So that should be a simple test, cheap test, that mm -hmm. not, not, not necessarily makes a diagnosis, but help you, helps you to to, uh, to, to sort of improve the diagnostic pathway, if you will. So actually tell you, this is a patient with a high likelihood that he has TB, so let's, let's um, send the sputum of that patient for gene expert testing, for example. So simplification is extremely key, isn't it, to keep Absolutely. costs down as well, as um, our earlier guest mentioned, um, Professor Anthony. Yeah, uh, okay, my, my, my other question, you, know, you talk about it in terms of how to convince the policy makers to use the, the best use of research finding. What, what is the most important thing here that the policy makers, decision makers need to know in order to you know, uh, support a good research findings? You can then say one or two. Well, I think there is, I mean, I mean there's, there's something, well, that's true in tuberculosis, but it's true in most diseases. In the end, what is decisive is the cost implications. And I think we are underestimating this issue, um, that in the end, cost effectiveness and affordability are major uh, drivers of the decision to scale, a new, to scale up a new technology. So that's a plea for, for in much more involving uh, health economists and economists in those kind of evaluations. That's a very good uh, suggestion. So every uh, trial we try, we have to try to put some cost effectiveness analysis mm -hmm. in, in you know, most of those uh, studies, if possible, in yes. order to be... Yes, in, I think, yeah, yes. Yeah, I think that would good. really help. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming in to talk to us. There also highlighted what he talked about inside the conference room there. Two key areas, operations research, making sure that um, it reaches out to the grassroots level as well. And also another key point that he's just made is that it's important to engage policymakers. And when you engage policymakers, affordability, this is also an important aspect of it all, cost effectiveness. The other key area that Professor Frank brought up during his talk was global policy. And now this is um, also important as you do want to implement research and, and, and have it effective in various countries as well. We thank you very much for your time and we also look forward to your talk. You're going to be your specialist focusing on TB tuberculosis. So you'll be talking later at one, so you've still got time. At one, you'll be, he will be addressing ending TB, giving you the global perspective of things. Frank Koblenz from the Academic Medical Center and Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and Development. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more guest who is going to make his way here to the hot seat over here and tell us more. 
regarding the latest advances, etc. We're focusing on research, translating that into practice as well as policy. Let's bring up here Professor David Cooper, the director of the Kirby Institute for Infection and Immunity in Society at the University of New South Wales, Australia. Good morning. So Good morning. Ha. I'm going to be playing timekeeper and Professor Prapan, you will be posing Professor David here with a question. So, Okay. Thank you very much, David, for your talk. Uh, um, I think I would like you to, you know, De Professor David Cooper has been in HIV care and research for the last 30 years, uh, more than that year. I would like you to, uh, to tell the audience at home here that what, what kind of changes that we have seen during the, the last 30 years of work on HIV and AIDS? The well, major uh, success that you think that you know, we, we, we should all be proud of? Well, I, I think the major success is, of course, antiretroviral therapy uh, from a, a disease that was almost uni uniformly fatal, where uh, I recall that uh, I had a ward full of patients uh, in, the, in the 1980s and early 1990s uh, who were all sick and dying. Uh, when I first came to Thailand, you had the same, uh, you had the same issue. Uh, and there was nothing we could do for them apart from give them drugs for opportunistic infections and sometimes a person came in with pneumocystis pneumonia and uh, you got them better with cotrimoxazole they had a honeymoon period and then of course they got sick again. Um, and it wasn't until uh, antiretroviral therapy came along that uh, this made a difference. So I don't think there's been any intervention in modern medicine uh, that has been so successful in such a short period of time from the discovery of the virus to, to implementation. Uh, it, it, it is, I think, a modern, modern mer medical miracle. You're right. So besides the effective medication, the, the price of medication is also much cheaper nowadays so that, you know, uh, more than 17 million people throughout the world can receive the medications now. Right. However, in order to get person to come to receive the drugs, they need to know that they are HIV positive. Right. What is your suggestion or advice to our audience here? How to get more people come for HIV testing or in their HIV status so that they can benefit from the powerful medications? So I, I think we have to test more people. So originally HIV testing was full of um, problems, right? Because if you had an HIV test, there was, in the, in the, the first days, there was, you know, if you were HIV positive, there was nothing you could do about it, right? So mm -hmm. it wasn't really, you could understand the community viewpoint. There wasn't, wasn't actually worth worth knowing right? and uh, and so the mystique of testing sort of grew around that of you know of voluntary counseling and testing and so on and, and it was almost a bit of an industry about you know doing that um, I think that the thing has changed now people with HIV are all recommended to have treatment I think we have to normalize it we have to make it normal and as part of normal medical practice. So everyone should have an HIV test at some stage in their lives, right? Everyone who's at risk of HIV should have regular uh, HIV tests. And we've just got to normalise it and say that this is what everyone does. Right? Uh, and, and I think we have to have young... Um, young role models uh, uh, for this. So, uh, for example, I was very impressed at the World AIDS Conference in Durban, um, uh, where sort of Elton John handed over the, the reins to Prince Her Harry, right? So Prince Harry, a young person, very famous, very admired by young people, takes an HIV test, right? We have to we have to normalise. Um, we have to normalise this and make everybody aware that everybody should be tested, both for their own health 
um, and for the benefit of the, their partners and communities. And of course in Thailand there's very strong community uh, goodwill, right? So I, I think of all places Thailand should be a place where people undergo undergo testing. Okay. I Thank think you. in terms of, of, of discrimination and stigmatization, that's still a, a big challenge that here in Thailand we have to overcome. Isn't that right, Professor Prapan? Urging yes, is, people, yeah. high-risk um, mm -hmm. people, to go in and get tested. I mean, there are facilities and there are civil society NGOs going out to help, but still this is a, yeah. a main obstacle. Yeah, this is the most difficult thing to, 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 to solve. The so I didn't, I, I especially didn't mention <laughs> stigma and discrimination <laughs> because I think the medical system or the, the health system, right, the health system has to normalise, right? Okay, and yes, once yes. the health system normalises, mm -hmm. um, I think that that can be a major component of reducing uh, reducing stigma and uh, discrimination, right? Uh, it won't be the total answer, I agree, but uh, it, it, we have to uh, get our act together mm -hmm. as well. Right, and I think um, the mass media has a very, very important role to play as well. Like you said, um, Prince Harry and Elton John there, perhaps we can find some local celebrities and stars like to, you, shine, <laughs> to, to, to shine a spotlight on this issue so people are aware, educated and up to date with the latest and that they are in the know that there is ART and there's um, same day ART as well and that they can actually live a normal life and, and, and reduce that stigmatization. I think it takes a lot of work from all sides and mass media. Parents have to play an extremely important role as well because here, it, having sex, it's, it's behind closed doors, isn't it, Professor? This is the Thai context of things. But I believe it's more open in Australia, isn't it? Um, look, I think, you know, sex is part of people's normal lives i think we've just got to get over it people mm. have sex whether you're gay or straight or whatever you are uh, or transgender and let's just normalize mm -hmm. it and be happy with our sex lives and right. get on with it you right. know? And, um, so, let's not uh, let's get it more out in the uh, out in the open right? Right. and i suppose australian society uh, is certainly uh, in some parts of australian society we're mm -hmm. better at Mm -hmm, than mm -hmm. other countries. So that is possibly for the Thai context. We might want to bring somebody up here to discuss that and how we can, uh, the different channels, in normalising it in the words of Professor David Cooper. We thank you, Professor David Cooper, for taking the time to share with us your perspective on matters here. Thank you very much. You. Okay. Now, Professor Prapan, okay, don't leave you. just yet. We have about two to three more minutes to wrap up this session, so you get to continue to stay, and we'll have you wrap things up and, and say some concluding words regarding translating research into practice and policy. Yes, I think research needs to be done because for the uh, advancement of either science or the benefit of the people in general. Uh, however, uh, in order to even to plan any research, in ad, you know, to plan the research in advance, they, have, they, they need to think about who will use the result of the research, mm -hmm. how, to, how to convince the, uh, all the stakeholders in order, to, you know, for especially how to convince the government who is the, the final players, the main, main players in terms of uh, uh, financing uh, all, the, all the activities. So, so we need to think around and then just you know, try to make the research findings uh, 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 practicable uh, uh, being used, and if you know, we know something that we can further improve the, uh, our initial research uh, findings, we should uh, continue doing it, so called implementation of research, so that everyone will benefit from the research results. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much you. indeed for helping me out here for this first session for the third and final day of this um, 19th Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine. Now, um, to wrap things up, Professor David Cooper, he talked about antiretroviral therapy as a modern medical miracle.
Now, we are going to be focusing on that, ART. We've talked about it a lot, but for our next segment, we are going to find out how um, it works in real life practice. So we'll be having the experts come here and, and tell us about ART in real life practice and join us for the session that will begin at 12 noon after the experts share their information and their presentation inside the conference room, and then we'll bring them to the spotlight over here. So for now, thank you very much, Professor sure. Prapan Panupak, Director of the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. Thank okay. you. Thank you I hope much. to see you back later okay. on. I hope not. I <laughs> hope it's someone not. else who will well, take care of I yeah. hope okay. so. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very thank you. much indeed. And thank you very much to all of you for joining us. Don't forget to join us again at 12, talking about ART, real life practice. For now, I'm Katari.